we doing at the 10 a.m.? How are we doing? Yo, that was terrible. How are we doing at the 10 a.m.? There we go. Hey, if you're online and joining us, we are so glad that you are here too, and I'm glad you've joined us. We're in the middle of this series called My Serve, Your Advantage. I love this series. I absolutely love the tagline of it. Uh, so always in everything serving others. And we are in the midst of Ephesians. Uh, and this chunk of Ephesians really is taking a look and it's an encouragement how to deal in relationships. And so we've looked over the last two weeks at marriage. Uh, today, I'm actually going to be looking at singleness. And this chunk of Ephesians is interesting because it speaks about a Christian household, a Christian family, a, a Christian community, how this thing plays. Because it moves from marriage into parent and child relationship. And then it actually moves into the workplace where it speaks to masters and slaves employees and employers and how to deal with that. And we felt it's so important that this series actually spoke to all people because we believe that that's what God's, God's Word does. And so in the middle of it, we're actually going to take a slight detour out of Ephesians. Are you excited for that? And the reason we're doing that is because we are saying if this series is so important, and we are all called to do this, to serve one another. And it actually speaks about serving one another out of our reverence for Christ. Then what does that mean in every stage and every season? And so as we have for the last two weeks speak, spoken to the marrieds in the house, we wanna take a moment to speak to the singles. And so I know so many uh, of our singles, and there are many within our community, have really enjoyed the last two weeks. It might've been a bit odd, it might've been a bit out there, but amazingly, this is what God's Word does, is it will start He'll speak to us and there'll be things for uh, God speaking to you through His Word. And so I wanna encourage you, there is something for you today in this, even as we take a little bit of a detour out of Ephesians. I wanna tell you this, that if you are single and you're a part of this community and you feel called uh, to be in this family, I want you to know just how valued and how cared for you are. So much so that we're like, hey, let's have this whole thing focus on you today. So you're the VIP, you're the important person, you're the one we wanna be speaking to. The rest of us will get a lot out of it. And I wanna put the disclaimer out there. I understand we're doing a preach on singleness and I'm doing it as a married guy, a guy who got married very young, a guy who has been married for years and now is in the midst of toddler and baby life. For some of the singles in the house, in the community, I know I am living your dream, what you're actually desiring. For others, I know I'm living your nightmare. I know that is true too. Um, trust me, a two-year-old and a nearly six-month-old um, is fun. On weeks where there's teething kicking in, on both. We had that last week, it was good fun. But I want you to know that as a single person in this community, that all I can do as a married guy, a leader in this church is say, hey, God's Word speaks to every single one of us. And so even in prepping this and getting it ready, I asked myself the question, what does God's Word have to say? And I'm just gonna say that. Is that good? Is that okay? That's everything out of the way. I wanna remind you of this quote. I had forgotten about this quote, but I absolutely love it. God's Word is so alive and it comes after us. Uh, Martin Luther was a German reformer back in the day and he said this about the Bible and I find it so encouraging. He said, the Bible is alive. It speaks to me. It has feet, it runs after me. It has hands, it lays hold of me. That's what's gonna happen today. Let's pray and we'll get into this. Father God, I wanna thank you so much that you do have a word that is alive and active. You do have a word that speaks to every single one of us wherever we find ourselves. Lord, your truth is something that can dive deep into our hearts. It can bring clarity. It can give, it can give meaning to the uncleanness and the muddiness of our world. And it's my prayer that your love, your revelation, your truth would become so tangible to us this morning that every single heart represented, whether they're in the room or on the stream, that Lord, you have something to say. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. So a preach on singleness can be quite general. And uh, before we dive into the content, I wanna speak uh, just for a moment and talk about who I'm actually speaking to. Because it's quite a broad thing when you start to say, hey, let's talk to singleness. Now, singleness actually, interestingly, is something we will all have in common. Because there will be a time in our life where we will be single. You may have been single, you may be are single currently, or maybe you will be single sometime in the future even though you aren't right now. And so we have this thing in common and it's a season that I believe God wants to speak into this morning. 
And I know there's different categories, there's different situations, different circumstances that your singleness might look different to someone else's. And so I'm gonna bounce around some terms. And I know sometimes these terms can be alienating and not so helpful. And so up front, I wanna talk about it. I know that there will be some that are unmarried that I would be speaking to. Those who actually have a desire to sometime in the future be married, that that's actually the road you wanna go down, that road of marriage. But I know for those who maybe that's not on the cards and not actually something you're desiring, if I call you unmarried, it's somehow now alienating because now I'm putting marriage as some like stamp of approval on your life. And because you don't desire it, now there's a problem. I don't want that to happen. And so I'm gonna bounce between those terms, but I want, you to, I want it to be helpful to you so you know where I'm coming from. I'm aware that there will be those who have the desire that maybe you're only called to singleness for a short time, for a season. There are those who it is a longer journey. There are those who are actually single by choice. I know there are people in our community who feel that they are genuinely called and given the gift of singleness by God. And so that's the road they're gonna walk, whether that's for a season or a lifetime, that's up to God. And then there are those who have become single. You weren't, but you are now. And so that can be single through circumstance. And so I'm also aware that there may be some who have become single because of something going wrong. Perhaps you have walked the road of a divorce. Maybe everything went belly up, you're single again. Maybe you've actually gone through a tragedy, lost your partner, and you're actually finding yourself in that season of singleness again. And both of those will be asking God, what does this look like for me? How am I supposed to walk this thing out? I want you to know that God is gonna speak to every category, every age, every stage. Whatever you find yourself in, He has something to say. How I'm gonna attack this is I wanna start in the book of Ephesians. We're gonna start on a main verse and then I'm gonna bound, detour, detour us out. And the one verse I wanna pull out James actually spoke about it over the last two weeks. And it's one for all of us. It's not just for mar the married, it's not, just, it's not isolated, it's for every single one of us. In verse 21 of Ephesians chapter five, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. No one's exempt, everyone is included. We are actually all called to do this, to submit to one another, to serve one another. And the fuel for it is our devotion, our reverence, our love for Jesus. And so that's relevant to everyone. It's especially relevant today as we look at singleness. And we're gonna detour out actually into another piece of Paul's writings in 1 Corinthians. And this is the plan of action. I wanna take a deeper look at our view of singleness. I wanna take a deeper look at how we view single people and the season of singleness. And I'm gonna talk about it in a general sense right now because I do believe we have a problem with singleness. Whether you, when you look at society as a whole and sometimes even when you drill down to our own preference and our own thinking, we can have a problem with singleness. And I believe it's because we actually have the wrong view of singleness. Because I actually think when we look at the world and how it views single people and the season of singleness, it is often attributed to something that is undesirable, something that is less than, something is, that is just a, a weird transition waiting room before the real life kicks in and real impact can be felt and the real experience of relationship gets there. We often will make jokes about it. We'll often say, hey, you're single, what's wrong with you? We'll crack jokes about the, the old single lady who's got 29 cats. This is what our society does. And I think it's because we do have this problem in understanding singleness. And I don't believe it's the view that God has when He looks at our singleness. I wanna acknowledge this upfront as we dive into it. I wanna acknowledge for a moment that I do believe the church in general has not served single people or the season of singleness very well. I wanna admit that up front, because the truth is I think by its teaching and by its practice and by how it's gone about uh, doing this, I don't think we have served those who are single very well. I want you to know this and, and, and us marrieds need to realise it. The truth is most of our church experience is catered and tailor-made for us and not necessarily for those who are single. I want you to know that we, we put these things together to make your experience amazing. We'll make plans and, and, and put together ministries for your kids and uh, we do all these things, but at the end of the day, we have to take it on the chin that sometimes our singles have been left by the wayside. That actually most of our content is not aimed at them, most of our, what we do is not aimed at them and actually most of our care doesn't go their way. 
I want you to know as a single person, this community is better because you are in it. We value you, we care about you, and we want you to know that. And us as the marrieds need to be better. Us as leaders, us as people in a community that God's called us to need to understand that if we are to serve one another, it means we're there to serve everyone, not just our married friends. We're called to serve everyone. In prepping for this, I, I did an exercise and it, it, I'll be honest, I was trying to be funny and it just became heartbreaking and it just wasn't funny anymore. I sent a message to a bunch of uh, single friends, uh, single people we have in our city group and I asked them this question. I said, uh, why don't you just send me the worst thing you've ever heard about or to single people in church? And I won't lie, the responses I got were heartbreaking. I'll give you two of the, of the ones that really paint the picture. The worst thing you've ever heard at to or about singles in church. You're single because there's some sort of sin that God needs to get out of you so that you're ready for marriage. Do you wanna sit in a seat and have me preach that at you? How about this one? You wanna get married, but if you get to 30 and it hasn't happened yet, you might need to come to terms with the fact that singleness is God's plan for you. We dive deep into issues of sin and identity and purpose, and we put this on single people and forget that God has a plan for that and a gift for that and something to say about that. And so that's all I'm gonna do today. I'm gonna take a look at God's Word and say, hey, what does it have to say? to those who are single, to those who maybe were single and those who maybe will be single in the future. And we're gonna do it by looking at two big questions. And I think it's two big questions I've heard and seen uh, single people really wrestle with. The first one is this, big one, number one. What am I missing being single? I spoke about our view of singleness and so often we see it as something less desirable, something that's actually lacking. And in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul actually begins to speak to the unmarried, to the widowed, to those who would be considered single, not married, you're walking the road of singleness. And so it's directly to you. And this is what he has to say in verse 32. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and the wives are happy. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I didn't get an amen, I was waiting for an amen there. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So often our view leads to this approach to singleness, that somehow when I look at my singleness, when I try filter it through and my experience of it, what I, what I start to do is count what's missing, count what is absent. A little while ago, we were joined by George Giorgio from PE. He came up, spent a week with us. And uh, on one night, he did a, an unmarried initiative, being a single guy speaking to single people. And the very first thing he said was, first of all, you need to start by realizing you lack nothing. Because so often we will look at this season and phase of singleness, this calling of singleness, whatever it might be, and we see it with what's not there. We forget that actually God has put some very special, specific things there. And so it's not about what is absent, it's actually about what God has given. And I love that it's, it's not the experience I will have. It's not gonna look the same as my experience being a married person and a dad of two kids. But I want you to know that it is not inferior, it is not lacking, it is not second rate. It's not actually something that's less desirable. In fact, it might look different, but it's got its own gift, its own run. And that's what God wants for us. That's why I love Paul, how he starts this, where he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. I know too many people who are walking the road of singleness right now and the word over it would be anxiety. And I believe it's because you have this view that there is all this stuff missing. And it leads you down a road where you begin to compare. This is what I don't have, this is what they have. I want you to take a moment and take a stock. This is what God has given me. What am I supposed to do with it? 
there's three big things I believe and I've heard single people wrestle with that they believe is missing because of their singleness. The first one is partnership. There's a reality to single life and I don't wanna skim over it. There's a reality that you will have moments where you get home and you get home to an empty house. That there are gonna be events you get invited to and you don't have a date for and because you don't have a partner. And I understand and can understand that that can be a very lonely road that there's space where that can feel very isolating, where you can have this desire for connection and someone to do this thing with, to partner with as you walk through life. But I wanna encourage you and turn your focus to what the married person doesn't have. Because sometimes you can look at the other side and you can begin to go down the road of comparison and it's not healthy, it's not helpful. But I wanna draw your attention to what you have that the married person doesn't have. Because yes, they might have a partner, a physical person who is there and present, but I want you to know that that partner so often can get in the way of them and God. It so often can be the thing that hinders us in our relationship with God. Whereas you have a direct partner in Jesus. And this is especially important if you are walking that road where you desire marriage and you're on the, the road to marriage further down the line. Because I need you to know that you are on the search for a partner, a godly partner, that's important. But what you are not on the search for is another saviour. There's only one person who fills that seat, who sits on that throne and his name is Jesus. I wanna tell you as a married person, so often you can get to that point where that partner becomes everything to you. And I am so aware of it because I am called to lead my wife, to care for her, to protect her, to encourage her, to be her safe space. But there is one thing I was never called to and that was to be her saviour. And so, so often you can ask Nikita about this. When she has come to me and she is uh, frustrated or angry or sad, I will very often stop her on the front end and ask one question. Have you spoken to God before you came and spoke to her? Every excuse under the sun why that shouldn't be the case. But the truth is God's Word is crystal clear that this is how this is meant to go. That actually it doesn't matter if you're dating in a relationship, living together, whatever it might be, until that covenant relationship of marriage has been established, sex isn't on the table. God created it, God designed it. And so as creator, He actually has the right to define its boundaries to actually define how it is played in and how it is best done. Does that mean he's a killjoy? Does that mean he's against? No, the truth is God is not against sex. He made it, but God is for marriage. But so often, what do we do? We shortcut, we short circuit, we go ahead, we try to cut the corner. And guys, we are the worst at it because we try short circuit and get ahead and, and have our cake and eat it too, but forget that actually we've been called to lead and to protect and to care for that girl. But in what we are doing and short circuiting God's plan and God's design is we're actually robbing the blessing of God over this relationship now and into the future. Everyone thought I was gonna say this some smart, clever way. I'm not, I'm just gonna tell you how it is. That's a bit of a tangent. I'm gonna bring it back. So if sex is not something that should be present in the single life, then what is present? Notice I didn't say that sex is the thing that you feel you're missing. I said intimacy, because here's what we miss. We think, oh, maybe I'm missing sex, and we bundle it all up in this idea of intimacy. But the truth is in the single life, intimacy is still on offer intimacies can still be present because what we're talking about is actually a question of satisfaction. Yes, I'll be upfront and honest. Sex can satisfy a desire. It actually can do that. But every single one of us have to have the moment where we discover this truth that it doesn't matter if you're married or not, there is nothing on planet Earth under the earth, above the earth, that can satisfy a human heart, a human life, a human soul, a human body, like relationship with your Creator God. That actually there is nothing that can satisfy 
like a relationship with the one who created you, who's actually able to define your identity, give you your purpose, place the value that he had in mind as he put you together. And so you can try, you can have all the sex you want, every relationship you want, get all the power you want, pull up all the money in the bank account as much as you want, go on the travels around the world as much as you want, and none of it will satisfy like a relationship with God Himself. Because His presence and His relationship changes everything, and that's the type of intimacy that's on offer to every single one of us. The truth is, you can have sexual desire quenched in a moment but it'll come back tomorrow. That intimacy that you can experience in a relationship with God, you'll never thirst again. It's complete, it's comprehensive. There's nothing like it. It's why all this stuff, all of these desires always fall short. We get God and we get God in His fullness. Third thing you may believe that you are missing is the idea of covenant. I love it how Paul puts it in verse 32 where he says, the unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. Over the last two weeks, James took a deeper look at the covenant of marriage. That's actually how God has designed it, as a covenant. I'd encourage you, if you missed it, go jump on them, on our YouTube channel, they're amazing. And the reason covenant is so important is because it goes so against what we think. Because we think in terms of contract. We think in terms of that's your side, this is my side. I do this, you do that. If you don't do your thing with this thing's null and void, we're done. That's not how a covenant works. A covenant actually says, I understand I'm making a commitment under God, looking God in the eye, saying actually it doesn't matter what the other person does, if they come through or not, I will do my part. You look at the picture of Abraham in the Old Testament as he makes a covenant with God himself takes three animals, cuts them in half, and both him and God walk through the middle, basically saying, hey, this is my covenant. I will follow you, you will be my God, I will be your people. And if it is not like that, if I don't do my part, let me be like these animals. Let me lie destroyed like them. That's what a covenant is. It blows up any thought of, any thought that we have, any way that we view it in our worldly perspective. Now I've heard some single people wrongly say, well, because I'm not gonna experience a human covenant relationship, I'm somehow now, as I look at God, gonna get a lesser picture of Him. Because the gospel is all about covenant. It's all about God making His covenant with us as His people, as He draws us close and into relationship with Him. So somehow now because I am single and I don't get to experience that with another person, I will have less, a lesser view of God, a less picture, a less, great picture of the gospel. I'll have less understanding when it comes to these things. I want you to know that all of us are actually called into a covenant with God. And the covenant, the greatest one you could ever see is the picture we looked at in the last couple of weeks. And it's the picture of Jesus, the groom and the church, his bride. It's the best picture of covenant we have. It is far better than any human marriage and relationship could ever be. And that is not uh, excluded to some. It is actually something that is available to every single one of us. Every single one of us are called into that church to be His bride, into that covenant relationship. And so as a single person, you are not missing out on covenant because you're already in the greatest covenant the world has ever known. You're actually called into this community. The Bible talks about the community of the local church, that actually you get to be partnered in here. And the Bible only ever uses language that is covenantal. It's why when you come into this space, into this community, whether you're in the room or you're online and you're a part of this and this is home and this is your family, you need to know that you are a partner, not a member. You need to know that that's why when we speak about our steps process, we have five steps. One of them is the added step. It it comes straight out of Acts, that they were added to the number of those who were believing. And so you can be added into this community, added into this family, and the partnership will be a covenantal one. It's why it should be very difficult to leave this family. It should be quite difficult to move on because it's not just up and leave, stop paying your membership and and go somewhere else. It's actually, no, my roots are down here and they're down deep. We're all called into that covenant relationship. We're called to 
be in and serve one another. If you're a single person, you might have a physical nuclear family absent, but I need you to know that there is a spiritual family that is present, available and here. It's a family where you can get known and know others. It's a family where this serving one another it has the greatest opportunity to play out. And I want you to know that as a single person, you're actually perfectly positioned to serve the community God's placed you in. And I want you to know with your undivided attention, you're actually far better positioned than many of us who are married. It's actually a gift and a, and a potential that you have that no one else does. And so you lack nothing, but actually have everything to give. I wanna tell you in this community, in this family, in this church, we have some of the most amazing single people who serve this community so faithfully, who give their time, their energy, their money, their resource. They just give them themselves to serve the people that God has called them to be a part of. I wanna honor you for it. I wanna tell you that this place is far better because you are in it. And the challenge for us on the married side of the equation is this. The singles are far better positioned to serve, to give of themselves because we have some divided interest. That's, that's the truth. But that doesn't mean we have the excuse or the, the cop out to not do anything. And especially, I wanna ask this question and it might poke some buttons. I know as a personal, as a, on a personal note, as a family, we have been served so well by the single people in our community the single people who are in our city groups, uh, the people who are around us, they have served us as a family so well. They've helped us with our kids. They've helped encourage us, uh, love us, care for us. Married people, how are we serving those in our community that are single around us? Because the truth is they're killing the game at serving us. They're doing so well. They're going above and beyond. And my question is, are we as cognizant in how we're serving them, in how we're encouraging them, in how we're caring for them, because their road is just as difficult. I want you to know that this is something we need to do. We need to get our focus outward. Yeah, we've got interests at home, we have families, I get all of that. But the truth is there are single people who are doing so well, so much in serving us. And if we're called to serve one another, no one's exempt, everyone gets called into it. Second big question I've heard single people wrestle with is this, is my singleness a blessing or a curse? A little earlier in chapter seven, Paul says this in verse six. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. I don't know what your singleness might look like right now. I don't know what situation you're finding yourself in. You might just be single for a time. You might be single because of circumstance, or maybe you're actually single by cho choice and believe this is the life that God has called you to uh, run in. I wanna remind all of us that the Saviour we serve was a single man. I want to remind all of us that the words we are reading right now in Corinthians was written by an apostle who was single. And so if this question is ever knocking around, if we're ever wrestling with this idea of is this thing a blessing or a curse, I want you to know in all that we have said and the fact that our Saviour and many of those who uh, started the church were single, there is no space for thinking that this thing is a curse. But actually we are perfectly positioned for God's blessing in that season, in that calling, in that gift and in that space. I want you to see that it is called a gift. Now there are some who are single by choice. You believe this is a gift given by God, that He's actually called you to do this. And so often we'll get into the debate around the gift of singleness, what that actually is, what it actually looks like. Some will throw around the idea of the gift of celibacy. And I know so many will have questions about this. I wanna just say this, that Paul actually in his writing never speaks about celibacy. His teaching on this is that it is a gift and the gift is singleness. And he always actually talks about it as a choice and it's a choice for kingdom's sake. That actually there's a choice to have an impact in the kingdom, that's the reason. And he will always speak about the blessing of that life. 
He actually calls the calling of singleness a high calling. I love how he uses the, the phrase, each has his own gift from God. He calls it a gift, and this is where I think some confusion kicks in. Because when we hear gift, we start to go down a road where we question, is this thing a spiritual gift? Is this somehow a spiritual gift like a spiritual gift of tongues or the spiritual gift of prophecy? Now somehow we have the spiritual gift of singleness. That somehow supernaturally we're going to have a complete lack of desire for any sort of romantic relationship. Or somehow there will be literally no sexual desire present at all. Somehow this is the gift given by God. I want to tell you, I don't think that that's what Paul was speaking about. I know so many godly men and women who are in this space, who are single by choice and feel that that is the life God has called them to, that that is the road they are walking. But as they walk, they are literally walking with Jesus while being very mindful that they have to stay sexually pure to live out the calling that God has placed over them. It doesn't mean that there's a complete lack of desire. It just means that they have a calling that will trump their desire as any other calling from God would. We sometimes make this thing its own category. It's not. Because even as Paul speaks about it, when he says each has his own, and he even speaks about one of one kind and one of another, he's talking about there is a gift for singleness, but there is also a gift for marriage. And we know there's no spiritual connotation to that. There's no some magical supernatural way that you do marriage well. And so the gift is simply, hey, this is what's been given to me by God. And actually this is the road that he's called me to walk. You can be gifted for marriage. You can be gifted for singleness. But as with any gift from a God who is seen as our Father, who has good gifts for us, what I don't want you to miss, that attached to every gift that He gives is always a blessing attached to it. And so often I think we miss the blessing because we have this wrong view of singleness or we struggle to work out what this thing is or we get confused by this thing actually being a gift. It's a gift and so it comes with a blessing. And so if you're single, I don't want you to miss the freedom that you have available to you. It's a freedom that I might not have. There may be limitations on me that you don't have. You're gonna have a freedom and a mobility, meaning that literally when God calls, you can go. As God leads, you go. No hold back, just go for it. I want you to know that there's a freedom uh, in investment, that actually your time, your energy, your resource, your money can go without any divided worry or interest or attention and go directly to what God is calling you to do. I want you to know that there's freedom in devotion because you have a direct partner in Jesus, that actually you can build this full unhindered dependence on God. And it's why Paul gives this encouragement in verse 17. He says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to them and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. There are those who will be called to this. It's a high calling. You might be in it for a season. You might be in it for a time. You might be in it for a lifetime. That's up to God, but know it's a gift from Him. Know that it has a blessing attached to it. Now, I wanna, as a pastor, just for a moment, say, I've been speaking a lot to those who are single by choice, those who are in the season. I'm aware that there are those, even in the room, even watching online right now, where you have become single because of a circumstance and that circumstance might be quite dark. You might have had to actually walk the road of divorce. And so your marriage went up in flames and you find yourself single again. And you're trying to stand there and and, and fix the damage and walk the road of hurt and ask God, what am I doing? How do, where do I go next? Is this it? Or maybe you had to suffer the loss of your partner. You actually walked the road of tragedy and your partner is now gone and you find yourself single again. I understand that if you're in that space, me saying, don't miss the blessing in your singleness, don't miss that it's a gift from God, might be a difficult pill to swallow. I want want to tell you that I understand you're walking through the dark moments and it seems like they're getting darker, but what I want to draw your attention to in the midst of it God might not have been the cause of this. God might not have been the cause of the circumstance, but He's present in it with you. Because in the midst of our darkness and those dark moments, God is always shining His light. And the old adage is, well, does a light shine brighter in the darkness? We know it's a trick question. 
because actually the light didn't change. The light didn't get brighter. It's still putting out the same amount of power. But in darker surroundings, what we perceive is more of its brightness. And I wanna encourage you as you're standing in that moment where it maybe is feeling dark, where you're walking the road trying to understand what this looks like. In the midst of that darkness, don't miss the blessing and the gift of being able to perceive God's light and His brightness and His goodness towards you in that moment. So often we can get it confused because we have this view and we're trying to work it out and we can't deal. God in His Word, God in His love is saying, I wanna illuminate for you what this thing can look like. I wanna bring clarity to where there is uncleanness. I actually wanna bring uh, my tangible presence into this space because it is the only thing that can give you peace in the midst of that chaos. God has something to say to you. His Word has something to say to you and I hope you are listening. Those are two big questions. This is where I wanna end. If we had this wrong view and now I believe we've moved into the space where we have a right view, I believe that actually gives us a new playbook. This is where it's gonna get practical. Because if we're no longer seeing this thing as a place of lack, if we're no longer seeing our singleness as us missing something or something being absent, but actually that it's, in it is present uh, an opportunity and great potential for kingdom impact and growth and devotion to Jesus, that it's not this waiting room before life, real life kicks in, that actually it's a place where we can have an impact, where we can grow, where we can walk, where we can uh, do all that God has called us to do, then how does it look when we play it out? How does it look when we live it out? There's two playbooks I wanna speak about. Second one we're gonna look at is the playbook to singleness. But before I get there, I know that there are those who are desiring marriage. I know that there are those who are single right now, walking that road, but you want to go down that road of marriage. I think this completely changes our playbook for dating. When we have this kind of a view, God's view, God's truth uh, of the season of singleness, it's gonna change how we date. Because we haven't got to that point of making that covenantal relationship and jumping into marriage, we need to understand that the playbook will look very different. And there's four players that I wanna talk about. Number one is this. If you want an adult relationship, be an adult with an adult. I know that's some like one plus one equals two logic. Adult with an adult makes an adult relationship. But so often we go and we deal in our dating life in crazy ways and we're shocked that we actually have childish relationships. Now we don't call it childish relationships. What do we say? Facebook even gave us a button for it. We say it's complicated. The truth is it's childish. And it might be either we are acting like children or the person we're with is a child. Ladies, I just wanna say, I know you might love the guy, but if he is acting like a child and not like a man, don't be shocked when the outcome is a childish relationship. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. I want you to know that sometimes we just need to be honest and upfront with ourselves in knowing what we want to see on the other side and have the courage to deal with it now to make a choice now. That actually I'm gonna step into this thing as an adult with the maturity and the wisdom God has given me and is available to me in His Word. And I'm not gonna accept someone who's not there too. Second thing is this, forget this idea, I'll be better when I'm with the right person. We need to forget that. Somehow we have this random idea that there's this switch that gets flipped when you get into marriage and now suddenly you're all good and awesome. You're not. You're the same nonsense that you were before. You're now just married. And so we need to get this right and get it into our heads that you can never be like, oh, I'll be right when I'm with the right person in the right situation on the right day at the right time. No, this time is prep time. This time is prep work. This is actually training time. This is time to get involved, to understand that this is a moment where we can plan and prepare. This is a moment where we can practice being courageous in relationships, where we actually put ourselves out there, where we might get hurt. But trust me, it's easier getting hurt now than it is later when divorce is on the table. We need to understand that we have a value in this relationship, that we value ourselves, that we're gonna walk the road like this. 
And so every relationship, dating relationships, friendships, family relationships, whatever it is, that's prep time. That's time to work these things out. Number three is clear communication starts with you, not the other. Understand we can only control what we can control. And so we wanna communicate well. We want a, a relationship that's got great communication. Can I tell you, it starts with you and it ends with you because at the end of the day, you can't control the other. All you can do is help create the atmosphere for communication. And so do your part. Ladies, I wanna tell you, this is where you can help us guys immensely because we have no idea what we're doing. We don't know how to do this. We don't know what to say, how to say, where to say it. We need you to help us. And guys, that doesn't mean we have a cop out or we get the excuse, we don't get involved. God's called us to lead, He's called us to protect, He's called us to care, He's called us to be men to grow up. And so we have to step into that too and understand it starts with us. Number four is honour is our currency. Do you know how different our relationships would look? Do you know how different our circles would look if honour was our currency? If actually we stepped into relationships and dating and friendships and said, you know what, I'm gonna first honour God, I'm then gonna honour you, and I'm gonna honour me. Because the truth is, in the ideal world, there's only one relationship that won't end in a breakup. And so there's a lot of damage there. Can I tell you, we can, mit we can mitigate a heck of a lot of damage if we deal in honour. If we honour God, if we honour them, and we honour ourselves. Honour has to be our currency. It changes how we date. I believe it's also gonna change how we do the singleness, how we view it, how we walk in it. And so it gives us a new playbook for singleness. These are the three things I wanna talk about in singleness. Number one, seek God in everything. I spoke about that direct partner in Jesus, having that full unhindered devotion to Jesus. And I wanna remind you that nothing can satisfy like that relationship, like that intimacy. And so seek God in everything. And my prayer for us, my charge for us, my encouragement for us is that every single decision, every single moment, every single choice would lead us and progress us in our dependence on God. Number two, serve others. I hit this hard. We need to take our focus and put it outward. Because single people, you need to know the battle you might face is one of loneliness. The battle you might face is one of comparison. And the greatest cure to that is service. Because when you serve in community, you're serving people and you do it with people. And you become in that moment as you care for the people who are around you, as you serve those that God has placed you in, you become the most magnetic, most amazing person to be around and people love you. They care for you. And it's the greatest thing that will stop any form of loneliness, any feeling of isolation, because you will have the greatest connection and the greatest community the world knows. We get to serve others. And the last one is this, number three, thrive in the gift. Maybe you haven't seen it as a gift. I wanna encourage you, see this season, whether it's just for a time or for a lifetime, see it as the gift that God has given because that's what it is. Because He is active, He is present, He is the one who has handed it over to you. And His heart as a, as a Father for you is one of goodness, one of blessing and one of thriving. Do you know how different you would walk that road of singleness if you believed those two things, that God is with you and God is for you? Do you know how different tomorrow would look? Do you know how different this week would look? Do you know how different your, uh, your, mo your emotions, your feelings, your thoughts would be if you believed those two things, even in the midst of your singleness? At the end of the 8 a.m., I had widows coming up to me crying, going, you don't understand how much I needed that. You don't understand how much I, because I, I, I just wanna go into my ball. I just wanna go into my room. I just wanna be closed off. And it's actually only in serving others, in looking outward that I get served. We've heard so many different stories, even when we had hope stories around lockdown of single people saying, you don't understand how isolating that time was where you couldn't have this. Do you know how it's changed for those people now that we're here? Do you understand what that connection has done? Do you understand how they're beginning to thrive again? It's so important that we're aware of this, whoever we are, because we're called to serve one another at every stage, in every phase, in every season. We're gonna worship. We're gonna sing a song. 
and we're gonna talk about how God has fought our battles. And for some of you, I know that this road of singleness, however you got there, whatever it looks like, might be a battle. Can I tell you the battle is the Lord's? And every battle that He fights, He has victory. And that's available for us. Father God, as we lift up our voices, as we begin to sing and worship and lift You up in this place, it's my prayer that every heart in the room, every life on the stream, would be so touched by this truth that You are with us and You are for us, that You go before us, that every battle we face ahead of us, You won already because You overcame the grave. Jesus, Your Spirit is alive. Your Word is alive and it's speaking and it's active and it's present and it's working and coming after us. It's pursuing each and every one of us. Lord, might we be surrounded by Your love. Might we be surrounded by Your peace. Might we be surrounded by Your Spirit that brings clarity, that brings a tangible sense of Your love over our human hearts, our hearts that can be led astray, but You keep us in line. Jesus, in this place, we wanna lift You up. We wanna bring You glory, we wanna bring You honour, because You are so good. Your grace, Your mercy, Your peace is unlike anything. Only You can satisfy everything else for it fails in comparison. Would you speak to our hearts even as we respond, even as we worship. Lord, even as we lay these battles out in front of you, Lord, with thanksgiving and praise be our weapons. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs>